This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Pleasure to welcome you all and uh, to welcome Jonathan Saha, um, who is, um, we shared our uh, the same PhD uh, supervisor, Ian is. <laughs> so, um, Ian, uh, Jonathan studied his PhD at SARS, which is around the corner, and um, published the book from the PhD um, quite recently, a couple of years ago. Now, a couple of years ago. Um, on the, the title of which was Law Disorder and the Colonial State Corruption in Burma, um, circa 1900. And then since then has moved into this field of animal studies and looking at um, politics of animals. Quite recently came and gave a fantastic paper at Aberystwyth on milk and cows. Um, <laughs> And uh, recently published um, in the Journal of Social History on Muslim Beasts of Burma's <coughs> Animals um, and the Politics of Colonial Sensibilities. Uh, Currently, it leads, so um, on that, I'll hand over to Sean. Thanks very much, Matt. I mean, I'd actually promised to give Matt a paper in Aberystwyth on the killing of crocodiles and came and spoke about the milking of cows, so I feel obliged <laughs> to talk about crocodiles today. Um, this this paper is, is very, very fresh for me, and it, in, in some ways it's, it's a bridging that move that I've made from talking about the history of corruption to working into animal history. And so it's, it, it's somewhere between those two interests. You know, I thought I'd left one study behind, but when you get into another thing, you, you bring something of that with you. And in a way, it, it's, it's responding to some problems or absences in in my earlier work on the history of corruption. Um, actually, responding in a sense very belatedly to a question Angus asked uh, uh, at a paper I once gave on petitions about corruption within forest ranges and timber. And Ang Angus asked me about the ecology of this and whether there was an environmental historical angle to this. And I just dismissed him for the last five, hour, five years. Um, but, uh, but reflecting on it, the absence of dealing with the environment in that history, I think, is, is actually problematic. The other thing that was absent from that history of corruption and the production and making of the colonial state was economics. I didn't deal with corruption really in any sense of, a, of it being a, a form of economic exchange and economic activity, which, of course, a lot of corruption is. And this paper is an attempt to bring both of those things back in to, to that history of corruption project in, in, in some respects. But it's also more, more, in a historiographic sense, it's more of a history of how animals become commodified. Uh, and that is something that I feel has been neglected in the study of, of the history of animals. Lots of other forms of representation, and being a commodity is a form of representation in, in one respect, um, other forms of representation have been very well covered by imperial historians, how animals have been used in zoos to display national or imperial sentiments, the way that animals have been represented in scientific knowledge to demonstrate changes in natural history and embed particular notions of progress. All, all these different things have, have, been, have been studied, but actually how animals become represented as commodities or as exchange values hasn't hasn't really been looked at properly. And so I'm going to try and interrogate some of those things and again look at how the state is interacted with in everyday life as a key area in how animals, particularly non-domesticated animals, become commodified. And within that process I feel there's, there's two key commodities that animals as commodities get exchanged for. And one is money, obviously, and we'll come on to that. And, but the other, and the, the thing which I forget I'll focus on most, is licenses. So one of the things which I'm thinking about in this paper, or trying to think about, is what is a license, really, um, in, in this context, and what does a license do? The social life of a license, a little bit. So, I thought I'd start with... Crocodiles. And it's impossible to say 
with any precision at all, quite how many crocodiles were killed in colonial Burma. And then the statistics were kept on the number of wild animals that were killed on an annual basis, um, but their accuracy is circumspect, to say, to say the least. I mean, even the officials who were gathering these, this evidence found it extra, exceptionally patchy and either overinflated or completely missing. And within just the, divi the division of the Irrawaddy division in the Delta, the discrepancies between different districts were impossible to really account for on any ecological basis. Um, so the data is, is dodgy. What makes it even harder is that in that statistical data which the government produced, the government of India produced, crocodiles fell into the category of other animals. And it was a category which they fe fell in in an uncomfortable way because this reptilian predator was in there with wild boars and deer and other basically prey mammals. So it's very difficult to say and ex extract the place of crocodiles within that. But what we can say is that crocodiles were certainly targeted for eradication. There were state rewards intended to induce people to, to hunt them. Uh, by the start of the 1880s, for a crocodile of about 10 feet in length or more, you would get 20 rupees for, for killing them. For a crocodile smaller than that, you would get 5 rupees. Now, 20 rupees is not an inconsiderable sum. Uh, 19, in 1900, it represents more than the monthly wage of a sepoy in the military police, and it's about half the monthly wage of uh, the starting rank of a Mio Oak or a, uh, of a township officer. So it's, it's, a, it's a decent sum of money. Um, and as well as issuing these, these rewards, for the killing of crocodiles, they also licensed weapons. And actually, from seventeen, sorry, from eighteen seventy eight, the the licensing of, of weapons in British India became much much more easy. For the first time since eighteen fifty seven, people could could license guns um, and the sale of guns. This also happens at the same time as is a, a shift in gun technology, which means Europeans are selling off all their old outmoded guns. So, weaponry is sold. So at this point, crocodiles have both a bounty on their head and armed villagers on their trail. And partly as a response, or as a result of this, they go from being seen as a, quote, practically inexhaustible population in about 1890 to about 10 years ago, there being a population of 100 left in the Urani division. Um, where the population stands in about 1840, is, sorry, in 1940, is difficult, is difficult to say exactly, but certainly the numbers appear to have fallen dramatically. Um, based on the, uh, the numbers being killed, they drop off quite dramatically. But also the reports of local deputy commissioners say that wild animals have disappeared from the Irrawaddy, parts of the Irrawaddy Delta by the 1920s. So it appears that the population has dropped off quite dramatically. Now this is not actually an unusual process. The setting of bounties is a common way in which colonial states try and get rid of what are described as vermin. Now what animals are designated vermin depends on a number of different things, particularly their use to the colonial state as well as cultural associations with them. So elephants are useful, they tend to get more preserved, there are more protections on them. Uh, tigers are seen as sporting types of prey, uh, sorry, of predators, so they, they get some hunters who, who wish to protect them in a variety of ways. Crocodiles have absolutely no defenders. They are seen as gluttonous, they have, uh, they're seen as rapacious, and they're even associated with deviant, deviant sexuality in in imperial writings. They have absolutely no defenders. And so there's very little concern about what happens to the crocodile population. However, British officials are concerned about these rewards. They're not concerned about them because they don't think they're working. In fact, they're concerned about them for the opposite reason. They're concerned about them because they think that they might be working too well. So Visiting um, one of in the, visiting Rakhine Division, the chief commissioner in um, in eighteen ninety three, the chief commissioner said, "I had 
official in colonial Burma, uh, is told by local officials that people are breeding crocodiles in order to claim the rewards. He also hears that fishermen are going out and just killing uh, baby crocodiles because they're easy to kill and there's absolutely no risk involved. And this concerns him. And so he's sent out to ask the various deputy commissioners in the Irrawaddy division whether this is true, whether they've heard similar things. And it turns out they all have heard similar things, that rewards are being claimed on the basis of crocodiles which have been bred and then killed once they're born. One official uh, said that there'd been a huge rise in the number since this practice had been heard of, that in that one year, 88 crocodiles had been killed in his district. Districts by my side were also seeing numbers of about 22 to 64 crocodiles being killed. So this adds up, this is quite a substantial number of crocodiles being killed, and it also adds up to quite a lot of rewards being claimed. The response to this is to get rid of that lower threshold bounty. So the, the five rupee bounty for smaller crocodiles, they just get rid of that. Now it's only crocodiles which are over 10 feet in length that you can get a reward for. So that's their response to this problem. But of course it's only one of a number of problems with the bounties when you move away from looking just at crocodiles. In 1905, officials became concerned that villagers were making repeated claims for rewards by showing the same leopard or tiger skin in different districts. So you would take it into one place, claim a reward, take it away again, and take it into another place and claim the reward again. And it transpired that there was very little coherent policy on how to deal with this problem. Some people, when they got a skin, they would auction it off to the highest bidder, who would often then buy it and then reset, reclaim it, the rewards somewhere else, auction it off somewhere else, and that would keep happening. Um, other people would just return the skin back to them, um, and some would keep, the headquarters would keep the skin and they would then sell it. So there was no, there was no um, sort of clear policy on this. Others, and what was encouraged was a way of trying to deal with the skin so that they couldn't be resold or reclaimed. So some would punch them, some would mark them, some would dye them in different ways. But the worry was this would stop them being useful commodities after that. If you damaged the skin too much, you couldn't make anything from it. In other contexts, as I'll come on to in a sec, the punching of the holes and the mutilation of skins didn't seem to have any effect anyway. People would re-sew them, would change the skin so that they could still be claimed for for rewards, so it wasn't a very successful way of dealing with it. Also, it was explicitly stated that when Europeans came in with these skins, you, you could you could be sure that it was they weren't going to resell it. These ones were all right. So there was a, a particular assumption about duplicitous uh, Burmese uh, hunters to do with this. Now these types of these types of issues carried on. There was a problem with tiger cats being submitted as leopard cubs by cutting off the paws so you, of the skin so you couldn't see which one it was. That's the only real way you can tell the difference between a, a, a leopard cub and a, and a tiger cat um, was by cutting off the paws, so they try and stop doing that. And eventually by 1835 it's decided that all skins will be sent to the prison where the prison will cure them and then sell them. So this is the, the colonial state trying to fight these these fraudulent practices all the way through. Now, there are also reports of other types of practices, but not within the records which I've seen. So travel writings refer to people breeding snakes to claim rewards. And um, this also is something which is reported in the, Bombay, the Journal of Bombay Natural History happening in Bombay. Uh, although it's seen more likely that they're just stealing eggs and then when the, the egg, eggs hatched, then killing the snake. So that's one thing that happens. And Mahesh uh, uh, Rangarajan has, has written about all sorts of different practices like this happening across British India. Peter Boomgaard has also written about this happening across the Malay world in relation to tiger skins in his book Frontiers of Fear. And in a perhaps even more bizarre example, Michael Van has written about it happening in Hanoi, uh, during plague outbreaks and they put bounties on 
on rats, and apparently people were breeding rats in order to cut off the, the tails and using those to claim the rewards from the French authorities. These types of practices happen quite a lot in all these different contexts. Now, I think what we might need to do is think about these practices as the unintended but convergent consequences of this cross-imperial policy of setting rewards for remains of specific species. Now, in Burma, the imperatives towards setting these rewards were very localised. They were to do with the ecological changes happening particularly in the delta. So the, the expansion of rice frontiers meant that the mangrove forests, where the majority of wild animals lived, were getting further and further reduced. And also these ecotones, as they're called, the, the area between two different ecological spaces, so in this case the mangrove forest and the, the rice field, are areas where hunting of, of humans and domesticated animals happens most often. This happens in two reasons. One, the normal wild prey species, which crocodiles and others would, would prey upon, are also disappearing in this time period. Um, and they are all also more accustomed to interactions with humans. Humans and, of course, cattle. So whilst wild boar and other things are coming off the menu, oxen and buffalo and people are coming onto the menu for crocodiles in this, in this time space. So the value, or the use value, shall we say, of a crocodile, a dead crocodile, is less in its actual body itself, but in the way that it represents a diminishing threat to another form of animal capital, which is, in this case, the cattle. And cattle is really what is being protected here. The number of human deaths is, is noticeable, but it's quite inconsiderable in comparison to the number of, of cattle being killed. And cattle are hugely important um, for, for rice production, as I'm, I'm sure Ian could, could tell you better than I. They are transport, they are plough power, and they are fertiliser in these areas. They are also a major expense. And the price of cattle doubles between 1915 and 1930 um, because, because they are so important. Um, some people can't afford to buy them. They are another form of debt they take on. They would have to rent their cattle for a period of time. If it dies, if your cattle dies, you're in, in all sorts of problems, potentially. So cattle is hugely important, and that's what they're trying to protect. But obviously there was... There was no straightforward relationship between the size of the reward and the social benefit of killing a crocodile or the effort necessary to kill the crocodile. And I think this is where this tension of crocodiles becoming commodities through the issuing of rewards really, really comes out. We should understand these duplicitous practices as coming into the tension, uh, this exact tension between the effort of putting in, putting into killing a crocodile and the, the, the price of the reward. And for the colonial state, what they were trying to reward was particularly brave and hard forms of killing animals. For those killing them, what they wanted was the easiest way to kill something for a reward. Now, this might seem like a very straightforward way of thinking about things, but I think it actually demonstrates a particular way of thinking about animals that has to come about. And it also demonstrates the, the importance of the coming of capitalist forms of subsistence into the Delta. Now, there's a guy called uh, Ezra uh, Rashkow who's written on the Gons, uh, the Gon population in British India, who he argues a tribal population who become hunters uh, in, in forests in India because of, partly because of these bounties. It becomes a form of them being able to make a living and an income. I and mean, it's, a, it's a disastrous one because by the, by the 1930s, it stops being a form of income because a number of animals have disappeared so dramatically that they can no longer sustain a living on it anymore. In Burma, this is less the case. This is not a sole form of income in the delta for individual people. This is a subsist this is sort of a, an additional form of income for cultivators, or so it seems. However, there is some form of ethnic reification going on, and particularly for the employment of people for hunters, and it's particularly Karen groups in the in the delta who are being recruited for this type of who seem to be taking up these rewards. But we can come back to that 
in, in a bit. It's something I want to unpack and think about more. But the point is, this is a new form of livelihood. It's a new way of thinking about the crocodile, a new way of thinking about tigers. Now I want to move on to the license. Now in 1928, I came across, well, not, I didn't come across it, but a petition from 1928, I came across when I was recently out in Burma, uh, alleging all sorts of types of misconduct against a guy called Uba Tin, who was a forest ranger. Now, the, the guy who wrote the petition was apparently Mao, Mao, a guy called Mao Tamadi, or as they translated it, the British translated it as a righteous man. Although I think, and Burmese speakers might want to help me here a bit more, but I think they would probably better translate it as arbiter, or something like that along those lines. Of, anyway, maybe not. Um, but according to the petitioner, Uba Tin was a thoroughly corrupt official. He had claimed travel allowances for his entire family when only he had gone on travels. That's terrible. Um, he had issued false permits, allowing illegal felling of teak. He had accepted bribes for decision in forest cases. He had charged villagers with heavy fines in trumped up cases. He had shot a boy in the hand during a quarrel. He had kidnapped a young woman. And if these crimes were not bad enough, he had also committed offences against wildlife particularly wildlife which were, were protected. He had apparently gone out at midnight and shot an elephant and removed its tusks and mounted on the wall of his house was apparently or allegedly the head of a rhinoceros that he had killed. Now, petitions against low-ranking officials were, were regularly received and as I've written elsewhere, they were part of uh, the disciplinary structure of the colonial state, particularly the way that it reinforced racial hierarchy within the state. And trying to piece together a wider history of Ubatin's career might not <laughs> enable us in any way to, to, to say whether these accusations are true or not. However, the content of a petition itself is, is quite interesting for how, how the state is seen within this. And so within this Within uh, Mount Tamadi's uh, petition, the, the forest ranger, the position empowered with protecting wildlife in colonial Burma, is now reimagined as actually the power to kill wildlife without being punished. Now, this speaks to a much wider literature on, of legal theorists that say that the effect of law is not really to eliminate illegality but more to create a particular space for it and in this view corruption is what they call the secret of the law that laws contain within them the very possibility of their own perversion and game laws are no different they do not only establish legal, legal protections for animals they bring about an altered landscape for illegality in this case for illegal hunting Now, acknowledging this ambiguity in game laws, I think forces historians, and environmental historians particularly, to not only think about the legal mechanisms that exist, but think more seriously about their enforcement and think more seriously about the nature of the colonial state. Often, environmental histories present the colonial state as something of a monolithic actor whose policies have clear, definable effects. Um, and one of the effects which is often attributed to them is conservationism. I think we need to think more carefully about that. I think it may, it may introduce conservationism, but at the same time, it actually creates forms and practices of poaching that are imbed embedded in those very ways of attempting to police the environment. And the licence is one of those forms of, of enabling that, that form of corrupt killing, if you like. They also produced forms of tolerance. And in 1904, the government of Burma circulated a draft, which was going to be a general uh, game law for British India. And they asked them how the current existing laws to protect certain species, particularly birds and elephants, were working. And it turns out, not particularly well. One official from the, the Irrawaddy Delta um, reflected on his time working in northern Burma. And he, he said there, when he would issue 
licenses to European hunters and other hunters, they would basically ignore what he said. That he, he would put on there, you know, you can't kill elephants, and they would come back having killed six or seven elephants. He did nothing about this, which is also just as revealing. He also reveals the ways in which they would issue gun licenses, particularly to former military officials of all ranks, um, who would then make them living by killing a number of protected species, particularly, again, elephants, selling their bodies for meat and their tusks for, for, for trophies. And again, what is clear in this correspondence is that he didn't act to stop any of this. So there's definitely an area of tolerance going on, particularly from European officials for other European sportsmen. They complain about it, they have a go about it, but they don't really stop it happening. So we, again, we have this different sort of ways, levels in which these laws are actually enforced. So on, on, on paper, the colonial law provided protection, but in reality, it didn't. And during the early 20th century, you see a raft of different laws brought in to try and protect wildlife. In the mid 19, sorry, in the mid 1920s, you get a, a wildlife protection bill which comes through. It's five years in the debate, but it does eventually come in, and that separates the protection of wildlife from forestry to some extent by setting up a game warden, empowering them to to do all sorts of ways of policing it and bringing in quite strict licensing rules, licensing fees, um, which were marked against the potential rewards or potential prices that could be received from the remains of animals. So they try and keep the licenses above the market price of, say, elephant tusks and stuff like that. They also bring in a number of fines connected to all this. So all this is really, in a sense, even conservationism is, is based around a sort of a commodity idea. In the 1930s, another bill is brought in. They rush it through to get in before the separation from British India. Um, this strengthens and tightens these things and expands its enforcement. It also consolidates some other legislation and tries to bring it all in together. However, what both these pieces of legislation also do in the debate around them and in their, their sort of prefaces is talk about how ineffectual all the previous laws have been, how little effect it seems to have had, how much they've been ignored, how underfunded they are, and that they're, they're basically dead letters in many respects. And the 1930s legislation seems to be uh, very, very similar. Uh, in a very angry letter to the, the Journal of the Bombay Natural History Society, a guy with the fantastic name of Darcy Weatherby, uh, who's a sportsman, traveller, who spent some time in, in Burma, says that they, the, the current game laws are, are worse than useless, in his mind. They're totally underfunded. They expect, they have no one really to police them. They've increased the number of sanctuaries, but there's nobody actually policing the sanctuaries. Within the sanctuaries, it seems that there's quite a large number of of, of killing of elephants particularly, um, which goes unaccounted for. And he's particularly shocked by the number of gun licenses that are being issued. He notes that there are 40,000 gun licenses issued in the, in the few years under this new legislation, but very, very few hunting licenses issued. And he just leaves that for the author to, to draw their own conclusions from, for, for the readers to draw their own conclusions from. Now, game laws are only one part of the regulatory mechanisms going on here, and licenses are built into all other forms of wildlife protection or the commodification of animals. And one other sort of closely analogous set of legislation would be fisheries. Licensing for fisheries or leases for fisheries are also operating in a similar way. They often get left out of environmental histories, particularly environmental histories of hunting, but they're much more quotidian element of how this is going on, as is petitions to change the status of land, either from cultivatable land or forest reserves into grazing lands. And petitions and, peti and grants to do this are all part of this, this paperwork and this app applications for licenses and all sorts of stuff like this. And in that, that file I mentioned earlier, the petition from Mount Hamadi, the uh, it was, it's just one file of about 100 different petitions from 1928, 
anonymous petitions that have just been thrown together. It's an incomplete file in itself. Um, but the vast majority of those, well, about a third of them are about op officials smuggling opium. That, that's always a, a set of complaints. The rest of them are petitions about being asking to be allowed to fish in someone else's fishery or being able to have their cows graze in particular types of lands, um, build dams in particular areas in order to allow fishes to move to different spaces. It's all about negotiating with the state through licenses and through grants and through leases um, how they can interact with, with particularly animals, animal commodities, whether it's cattle, what livestock or, or fish. And in my mind, these are, these are actually quite similar to, to game laws in some respects. It, it's just been somewhat overlooked. So that, that file, to me, is a bit of a, a snapshot of these everyday interactions with animals as commodities mediated through the state and mediated particularly by, by licences. Now, these licences were, as always, open to abuse in different ways. So it's not just tolerance and tolerating certain types of practices. Fishing licences in particular, when I did my, my previous book, came up regularly as a way of, of extorting bribes, basically. By claiming someone was fishing without a licence, the, the, the sort of non... The way that people abused court systems were quite incredible, but the, the way that you could set a bail which would be so high, be higher than above the, the fine, would be a way of extracting extracting a bribe before the case even got to court. So you could use fishing licences, and particularly timber as well, timber licences in that way. On timber licences and abuse of timber licences, um, one of my favourite examples of this is so a forest ranger getting their mother to buy a, a timber license that, these, that she then rented out to the various different Burmese timber firms to use. So on one day, a certain group would have the license, they would pass it on to someone else who would then use it, pass it on to someone else who would then use it. So the materiality of these licenses is, and the social lives of them are, are quite, quite revealing. But I think to understand that, we need to think of them as commodities. The license is a commodity. In itself, as well as a lease as a commodity. And as a commodity, they're very interesting uh, in, in trying to find where their value is. Because their, their value doesn't, isn't intrinsic to them. In some ways, they're a bit like money. Their, their value is what is established by the state. They've got a set monetary value given to a license. So there's nothing intrinsic in a license that has that value. How you make a license certainly doesn't cost that much, and the paper it's made on doesn't cost that much. What gives the license its value is a disciplinary network that it's, that it's built into. It, I mean, you don't need a license to actually fish, right? Physically, you can fish without a license, and people did fish without a license. People could fish without a license. What a, what a license gave you was, an, was allowing you to do it. It sanctioned you to do it. It gave you sanction and freedom from, supposedly, state punishment for fishing. So that's where its value comes in. Except... The corruption, fraud, forgery undermine that intrinsic disciplinary value to it. And so the, the monetary value, the exchange value, which is attached to a license, is, is dependent upon that disciplinary mechanism. Otherwise, it really isn't worth getting. Now, I, again, here, this is, this is a way of demonstrating that there are complexities to thought going on in these corrupt practices that mean placing animals as commodities in particular different forms of, of networks, trying to work out value of an animal commodity in relation to other commodities is, a, is an imaginative representational process that is, um, is not one to be taken for granted. Um, and so that's, that's really where I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to go with this now, is, is trying to unpack these different forms of value embedded in, in, in animal bodies and the commodities which they're exchanged for, particularly licences and leases. The more I think about it, the more I feel that licences and leases have, have not really fully been un un understood yet um, in their material lives as well as their sort of economic lives. Um, yeah. Nevertheless, despite all this, all the problems, all the failings of them, 
to me, the licenses and leases are still key ways in which animals do come to become commodified. This is, this is still part of this interaction. They're still central to this interaction by setting market prices in different ways and of being mediating instruments for individuals. They mediate not only their interactions with animals, but mediate their interactions with the state and thus animals' interactions with the state in, in some ways as well. I could talk for ages about, about this more, but I, I'm not going to. I, I'm really just going to wrap up now with a, with a bit of a short conclusion, which is to reflect on a, on a book called Animal Capital by a woman called uh, Nicole Shukin, where she confronts what she calls the fetishistic function of animal science. Now she notes that animals as a commodity and as a symbol have the appearance of being sort of existing things, just straightforward. An animal is an animal, a tiger is a tiger. They have that impression, they give that, that representation to people, spontaneously existing. But she, she argues instead that this is really the effect of the fetish, as she goes with it. Animals, their bodies and their image were in fact imbricated, she says, in antagonistic social relations. So you can see how she's reclaiming um, the Mar Marx's idea of the commodity fetish to try and work through animals in uh, the, chain, the history of animals, particularly in the 20th century. But what it does is also bring, bring back economic power within animal studies in a way that it's kind of drifted out a little bit, except in some studies of livestock, but, but even there, not, not fully. Um, and has definitely put animate commodities back on the agenda. Now, the symbolic power hidden within animals that she says we should be excavating has been dealt with a lot. If you look, take the instance just of the history of dogs, there is a huge amount of literature on the symbolic work and material policing work that dogs have done in colonialism, in all sorts of different spaces and sites. Um, in fact, in some respects, becoming emblematic of colonial authority in some places. And the, the history of the, the German shepherd is interesting in that respect. Um, uh, or the Rhodesian Ridgeback, or whatever it is. There's a lot of stuff on the symbolic power of, of dogs. Also, hunting has been conceptualised for its symbolic colonial power in a variety of ways. Uh, also, the way it's built into particular forms of colonial government, that we're protecting you from the wild animals, but we're doing it through our very spectacular displays of killing, the, this type of mode of... Um, of, of governance that has been called predatory care by um, Anand Pandian in the, in the context of colonial India. So the symbolic stuff has been done a lot. The economic power embedded within animal bodies has, has, been, has been largely overlooked. Now, I want to end with a, a sort of caveat. I mean, in this, I'm not, I'm not saying that commodification is the predominant form of representation of animals, or that it pushes out other forms of representations of animals. There are still religious, cultural, of a variety of symbolic ways of understanding animals that coexist, sometimes uh, complement, sometimes contradict the commodification of animals as a form of representation. But I'm just increasingly aware that it is a, a, a very powerful form that is increasingly being left out in animal histories and in ecological, environmental histories more widely. And there is always a danger there that part of that fetish still exists, but it still continues to mask the economic struggles going on. When we talk about the dead crocodile, it is just a dead crocodile rather than a set of changing ecological and human relationships in the Irrawaddy Delta. That's where I'm going to stop. Mm -hmm.